Guard of Ecuador. And I feel like Ivan Avila. These men wearing a uniform that's a century and a half old are the picked men of the Ecuadorian army. They are sworn to defend the president. Uh, and I wish I could say they'd never lost a president yet. In fact, Ecuador has had 35 presidents, and some of them left fairly abruptly. But there's no doubt about it, this, this is an enchanting scene, a Ruritanian scene, a scene of, uh, of chocolate soldiers. Um, one feels, perhaps, that uh, one of these toy soldiers should marry the fairy from the top of the Christmas tree. The cream of the Ecuadorian army, these men, of course. Cavalrymen, as you may have heard from their spurs, they're wearing the uniform of grenadiers. And if you think perhaps this setting is a little out of touch with the grim realities of Latin American life today, well, what do you think an Ecuadorian would think of the uh, household cavalry? Who could have a nicer Christmas present than a general salute from the Ecuadorian army? This elegantly guarded palace stands within Quito, capital of a magic land where we're spending Christmas, in the high Sierra of Ecuador, two miles up in the skies. Quito, presenting itself with the compliments of the season, is cradled by the Andes with slumbering Pichincha in its backdrop of volcanoes. The city survived eruption and earthquake conquest by Inca and Spaniard, and quite enough revolutions. A colonial treasure house said to have a thousand churches and one bathroom. Actually, there are only 57 churches, and whatever your nose may tell you, in a crowd, there must be several bathrooms, surely. Quito, a Shangri-La of a mountain capital, is remote, romantic, aristocratic, and sleepy. Except, of course, at Christmas time. You may be spending your happy Christmas traditionally, but up here in the Andes, we have other ways of celebrating. The people of Ecuador are most amiable. I've got a lot of time for them, though I'll make an exception in a few cases. Like everywhere else at this time of year, there are the friendly drunks and the unfriendly drunks. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. 
Ecuador, a highly unstable little country, is slightly larger than Britain with half the population of London. It's full of pregnant buses, has only 500 miles of paved road and supports itself largely by selling bananas. A perpendicular land with a doll's house quality and a volcano at the end of every street. The Avenue of Volcanoes, a central valley lined, believe it or not, by 30 of them. Eleven of these equatorial mountains stand crowned by perpetual snow. Fifteen of them are over 15,000 feet. And from Quito, on a clear day, you can see eight volcanoes. Most are extinct, but some are dormant and threatening. Ecuadorians may live braced for an eruption, but they do live amid Himalayan grandeur. That avenue of the volcanoes is so grand, so majestic, that it's almost impossible to take in at ground level. So for a really unusual view of a white Christmas, I'm going to try a trip in a sky van with the rear door open. We are flying down the avenue amid the turbulence. 15,000 feet over the Andes, it's freezing up here because the eternal snows on those peaks refrigerate the air around them. There's an icy lake in a dead crater, it's miles high. I doubt whether these noble volcanoes have ever been looked at in quite this way before. For those of you who like to live right in the middle of things, this is the place. But it's so cold and it's so windy up here that I'm afraid I'm going to have a hard job convincing you that I'm standing on the equator. This is the normally invisible line that circles the fat waste of the Earth. And right now I'm standing with one foot in the southern hemisphere, one in the north, and it doesn't hurt a bit. In the southern hemisphere they're having a warm Christmas, in the northern hemisphere you're having a cold one, and here on this part of the equator I must tell you that uh, we side with you. This may be, of course, because this monument, which stands 15 miles north of Quito, is at an altitude of 7,790 feet. Here the sun always rises and sets precisely at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And at midday on the days of the equinoxes, on March the 21st and September the 21st, no shadow is cast here. This exact equatorial line was determined by a French expedition led by Charles de la Condamine 234 years ago. However, Charles just may have got his figures wrong. For 20 years ago, a geological institute worked things out rather differently, and they placed the equator as a few miles north of here, where today there's another monument, and you can take your pick. But anyhow, the middle slice of Wicker's world runs through this area, and I've got to tell you, it's cold. So personally, I'm heading south. Living in thin air two miles high can leave you tired and breathless. Another excuse for the persistent poverty of one of Latin America's poorest nations. Almost half the people cannot read or write, Fewer than half have shoes and houses. Most go barefoot and live in shacks. The sad, hopeless Indian is the destiny and burden of Ecuador. He carries the country on his back. Without him, there'd be no agriculture, and so, no food. No one to build roads and houses, no one to sweep streets, no one to do the hard labor. Hey. 
three centuries of Spanish rule and a century and a half of Republican governments have left no mark upon the apathetic Indian. His dress, his language, his home are just as they were in the 16th century when the conquistadores arrived. He plants the same crops in the same way. This is not only a refusal to assimilate, but to acknowledge. The melancholy Indian living out a life at once pathetic and primitive does not look at you, he looks through you. No other race can in this way make you feel that you may not exist, or that you are at best a ghost. The Indian never had any concept of himself as a separate entity. He was part of a social whole. So it could be that when, centuries ago, the Spanish massacred Indian nobles and leaders, they stunted the growth of this race forever, as though performing a lobotomy upon the brain of every enslaved Indian to be. With the heart of their social empire wiped out, a racial neurosis took place. Unable to understand, the Indian retreated. Deprived of dignity, he became degraded and turned to drink to his fermented corn chicha. The colonial Spaniard saw no historic race, only sullen, sodden animals. The condition of conquest. <laughs> Indian addiction to drink is one reason why time has passed them by. Whatever money they lay their hands on is immediately converted into alcohol. With chicha, from fermented maize, or with rum, they stun themselves into oblivion. The quickest way, perhaps, to the happy hunting grounds of the Indian's hidden dreams. Life in these high Andes is stern. Only fiestas interrupt its harsh rhythm, and these can go on for days. The Indian's idea of a Merry Christmas is uncomplicated. He just wants to get stoned out of his mind. In their never-ending struggle with the supernatural, Indians profess the Catholic faith. Their year revolves around religious holidays. Yet it's impossible to know how far they understand the abstract concept of Christianity. Worshipping their agonized Christs, they may well be speaking to older, more savage gods. Maybe asking a favor of a saint or a mountain. Lighting a candle or placating the rainbow which violates young girls. But their pagan ecstasy has been painlessly converted to instant Christianity by the addition of a saint's day, a mass, a benediction. Their priest's word is law. Yet, uh, despite such influence, the church has done little to improve the Indians' lot. They must even pay to have church bells rung for their funerals. Knowing just what to give for Christmas is, of course, an annual headache. Which is my cue for showing you what must be this year's most successful Christmas present for the man or woman who has everything. A shrunken human head. The Hivaros of Ecuador, the Amazon basin of Ecuador, are today the only tribe still head-hunting and head-shrinking. And the curious are advised to keep well away from them. It's a question of tails you lose, heads they win. You might well become a curiosity yourself and you don't want to be shelved at an early age. And of course you don't want your friends to recognize you. The Hivado warrior regards a human head as the ultimate trophy. It's all his medals and decorations rolled into one. And when in warfare he has killed a man, he cuts the head off just as soon as possible and as low on the neck as possible. He also, if he has time before the chap's friends come back, he also peels as much skin from the chest and the back as he can. To remove the evil spirit from the man he's killed, a spirit which might well be resentful I suppose, he blows a strong uh, mixture of tobacco juice up the nostrils. Uh, then he peels the skin off the skull and throws the skull away. 
The eyes are sewn together with thin thread and three pegs are driven through the lips. Afterwards, they're replaced, as you see here, by string. The skin is then put into a sacred pot, a pot that's half filled with water and with an astringent made from a vine. This keeps the hair from falling off and it's left to simmer for an hour or two. Really sounds like a recipe, doesn't it? First, get your human head. When it's taken out, the head has been reduced to about a third of its original size. Hot stones are put inside the skin to singe off any remaining flesh and the face is remoulded because by then the skin is rubbery. Then it's suspended over a slow fire and left for a night to get good and black. The more heads, the more trophies a Hivara warrior has, the more he's respected. So, if you want to get a head, get a head. These chaps, incidentally, are not chaps. They're made, I'm pleased to say, from goat skin. If you've ever complained about carrying home the Christmas shopping, well, get a load of her. The Indian woman knows her place, which is usually beneath some enormous burden. It could be one reason why you rarely see a young woman. They seem to go directly from adolescence to shriveled old age. For the Indian woman who wants to get ahead, the in fashion this year and last year, and every year, is a dashing trilby, just like the old man's. Some swingers go overboard and wear two. That last minute shopping spree is the same everywhere. And if this setup's not as antiseptic as Oxford Street, well, remember there are no queues, and it's easy to buy the beaks of birds, the hooves of llamas, or the wings of giant insects, all highly recommended for heart trouble. For another kind of heart trouble, there are useful love potions. And just try buying one of those in Regent Street. And as for Christmas dinner, well, there's a wide choice here. Everything guaranteed touched by hand. A favourite dish in Ecuador is roast guinea pig, which tastes like rabbit and comes served with the head and the feet on, which is quite enough to turn anyone vegetarian. I couldn't, I couldn't bear that. Okay. And so perhaps would these steaming bowls of mondongo, a glutinous soup of the intestines of cattle, with various other unspeakable things chucked in to give it zing. The Indians have entered the white man's world with distrust. Their marketing done, they leave gladly for the peace of their mountains. Quito may be remote and up in the clouds, but its politics are down to earth all right. There's been lots of excitement here. One president was assassinated right outside his office, and the last president threw out the United States ambassador which is an unfashionable gesture these days for hard-up, tiny republics. In a period of 23 years, Ecuador's had 22 different presidents, dictators or military juntas. And in one century, 16 constitutions. Perhaps it's the altitude. The ruler this Christmas is Dr. Velasco Ibarra, and it's the fifth time he's been president since 1935. He's also spent 30 years in exile. Known as the Old One, or, less flatteringly, the Skeleton, he's noted for endless oratory and his boast, give me a balcony and I will govern.
His main problem now is to incorporate the destitute Indian mass into the state, for race is the exposed nerve of equity. He must also do something about a birth rate, which is, after Costa Rica, the highest in the world. This may not look like a religious procession, but that's just what it is, swinging its way to church. Young Ecuadorians marching musically to celebrate a te diem in the principal cathedral of Quito. Military and civilians come together at the Christmas parade as armed forces cut a swathe through the public, encouraging them fairly sharply to make room for marching bands. The President and the First Lady ascend to observe their own presidential coach, bringing here to the Andes an ornate touch of the Lord Mayor's show. Boxing day is for sportsmen, in Ecuador as well. This is the day when one spectator sport is open to the public. If you feel up to it, you can fight a bull. After a year of shouting advice to matadors, you can get down there in the ring and show them how it should be done. The brave bulls are here, and so is the sand. You provide your own blood. At this tienta, at this Boxing Day meet, bull meets man en masse. And among the mass of show-offs, you can sometimes spot a promising torero, a budding Corobez, a future Ordonia. You may also be pleased to note that in this holiday free-for-all, the bull occasionally wins the toss. In a frantic world, there is, I suppose, an argument for building a high fence around Ecuador and expelling anyone who introduces efficiency or sanitation, who weans the Indians from their careless ways or discourages dancing in honor of the Blessed Virgin. Then this undiscovered land, where every day has the same length and the same climate, then Quito could surely wait for more centuries, serene and undisturbed. But whatever your private paradise, that's an Ecuadorian Christmas, a fiesta pushing all before it through squalor and majesty. Some seasonal celebrations in the high Sierra, a sort of Shangri-La. <laughs> 